Thank you, Vanessa. And hello, everyone. As Vanessa mentioned, my name is Nahul Diaz. I'm a vice president of data and analytics consulting here at ABAP. We're so very appreciative of the opportunity to present to you all today, and certainly appreciative of your attendance and engagement throughout this session as we discuss the elements of visualizing publicly available data. Before we dig into our topic, I'd like to provide just a quick overview of AVAP and share a little bit about ourselves. AVAP is a cross-platform industry-specialized global IT advisory and management consulting firm. Our span of consulting and technology resources enable us to build for the future faster and better than before, combining a massive breadth of experienced consultants across several consulting practice areas with the ability to support clients across multiple sectors and industries. Our data and analytics practice is within AVAP's advisory services business unit, which combined with other market leading advisory practice groups enables AVAP's consulting resources to support our clients through various offerings ranging from business analysis and process design, enterprise solution strategy, organizational change management, program and project management and testing and deployment activities. These consulting offerings provide our clients with the assurance that AVAP brings market leading technical and functional consulting resources to every engagement to support our clients' goals. Our data and analytics offerings span the entire data value chain from organizational data strategy, where we help clients develop a comprehensive roadmap to their analytics and technology investments, rapid ROI, where the focus is on driving adoption and utilization of an analytics capability across an organization's footprint, and continuous value to focus on sustained and scalable growth. These three pillars are complemented through our ability to execute engagements from robust and transformative solution delivery, supporting enterprise data initiatives, rapid Tableau dashboarding quick starts, Tableau technical health checks with a focus on the infrastructure, setup and configuration of a Tableau environment, and we even serve as a managed services provider to some of our clients to fully host their Tableau capability, a company with full service operational SLAs and hands-on maintenance and administration. AVAP is a sponsor again for this year's Tableau conference, and we're very much looking forward to engaging with you all throughout the duration of TC22. So come check us out at our virtual booth and let us learn about your data journey. With that said, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our presenters for today's session, Will Gilliland and Aaron Sheehan. Both are exceptional consultants in our data and analytics practice and have a really, really compelling use case here to walk you all through. With that said, Aaron and Will, thanks so much for taking the time here today. And Will, the floor is yours. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on how we were able to drive insights from publicly available data. My name is Will Gilliland, and I'm a senior business intelligence analyst here at AVAP. And hi, I'm Aaron Sheehan. I'm also a senior analyst in data analytics at AVAP. For our presentation today, we're going to talk through the details of our project with the Office of Budget and Management for state government. Our stakeholders want to replace manual Excel graphs displaying economic metrics in a weekly report with automated Tableau dashboards. These models leverage public data sources to drive economic insights about state citizens, businesses, and cities in an efficient manner. For our solution, we use Tableau's ability to connect to a wide range of ETL tools and multi-connection data sources, which provide the ability to automate and visualize these public-facing data sources. Public-facing data sources can be used to drive insights by your audience in both public and private sector. For example, gathering public data from Realtor.com provided metrics on how the COVID pandemic has impacted median list prices and active listing in the housing market. Some of the technology we use on this project is the Tableau Enterprise Desktop and Server, Alteryx, which is a transformation tool, Cloudera, Q Impala, and Hadoop's distributed file system, and a data engineering tool called StreamSet. For our development approach, after we gathered requirements for this project, we mocked up data from the public data sources in Excel and built out first drafts for our visualizations. Our data engineering team during the process worked on extracting, transforming, and ingesting the data to our data warehouse. Once the data was ingested to our data warehouse, onboarded, and transformed according to our requirements, we were able to easily replace the data sources, which allowed us to quickly iterate through Tableau development and work on multiple dashboards in parallel. And this diagram describes how that process worked. For this project, we were able to build 19 Tableau dashboards. Data sources are all ingested to a single centralized data platform with little to no manual work. We ingested data sources from nine public sources, seven of them being automated and two requiring manual file drops. 
dashboard display economic trends, year year comparisons with a focus on pre and post pandemic metrics for consumer and industry activities. Dashboards refresh on a weekly to monthly basis using a scheduling tool. Some of our lessons and learnings include successful change requests and requirements documentation allowed for quickly identifying pain points and prioritizing requirements. We iterated through over 280 requirements and change requests throughout the duration of this project. Common pain points included overlapping change requests, technology limitations, and a lack of control over source data. Some technology limitations included a limit on API calls in our data ingestion tool. A lack of control over source data led to issues with date formatting. Data mockups allowed for a quick start on Tableau development before data ingestion was complete, allowing for quicker iterations on feedback and change requests throughout the process. For a quick project deep dive, in this functional diagram, you can see the data sources are broken up by the methodology of how the data was ingested and lines note whether or not it was an automated ingestion process or contained some manual work. Once the data is ingested, it is transformed and published to Tableau server's enterprise agency site. The dashboards were then created in desktop and published to server to be viewed by our stakeholders. For our first use case, we're going to be talking about open table dinner, dinner reservations. The data for this dashboard is ingested from opentable.com and shows percent changes in seated diner dinner reservations compared to 2019 to see how the pandemic impacted restaurants across various geographic locations. As you can see on the right, the data includes increasing columns which create Create difficulties in building a structured hive table in Cloudera. OpenTable also did not have a public API to ingest the source data. We also ran into a pain point where OpenTable changed its format of the dates multiple times throughout the project. We landed on a solution where the stakeholder would download the data to a CSV once a month and upload the file to a Hadoop distributed file system, which is a Java based file system for storing large volumes of data. We then used an ETL tool called Alteryx to transpose the date columns to rows and create regex match functions which look which looked at potential date format returning the correct match and transforming it to a set format easily ingestible by tableau the clean data source is then published to tableau server which is automated through our control m scheduling tool for use on our tableau dashboard now aaron is going to talk to you a little bit about the data ingestion and prep for our open table data We were able to enhance our open table ingestion by using a data engineering platform called StreamSet. According to their website, StreamSet is dedicated to building the smart data pipelines needed to power data ops across hybrid and multi-cloud architectures. With StreamSets, we can create, execute, and operate continuous data flows that connect to various parts of our data infrastructure, including different sources, processors, and targets. If you're familiar with Alteryx, StreamSet is similar in that you can drag and connect different modules together and configure them how you need. So it's code free, but it can be code friendly if desired. The difference is that StreamSet is used for data ingestion for big data pipelines and Alteryx's strength is in data analytics. For this use case, the open table file is downloaded and manually dropped in a Hadoop file system or HDFS directory. There's no formalized drop time and the file name is inconsistent. Before it can go to Alteryx for further analysis, the file must be moved to an Alteryx accessible location in our Hadoop ecosystem and have a consistent file name for it to look for. The StreamSets pipeline pictured here was created to be constantly running or streaming, waiting for a new file event to be triggered by the file being dropped in the HDFS location configured in the first module. When the new file event occurs, the shell script module relocates and renames the file so it's ready for the subsequent Alteryx job. Overall, it's a very basic StreamSets pipeline here, and it doesn't do justice for what the platform is capable of. The next part of our project was able to utilize more capabilities, so I'll pass it back over to Will to introduce what we did next. Thanks, Aaron. For our next set of dashboards, we're going to discuss, discuss today the data came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the U.S. Census Bureau. These dashboards display employment and retail data ingested from .gov public data sets. Data for these dashboards were ingested using web APIs and displayed hours earning, hours worked, and retail sales metrics across various geographic locations. Metrics detail the daily and monthly percent changes in retail sales and private employees' wages and hours worked. Dashboards focus on specific states versus national data, Midwestern metro areas, and U.S. states. 
Tableau's parameter and mapping capabilities made these views extremely dynamic and functional across a variety of measures. Some limitations we ran into was a limit on API calls, which Aaron will speak on. We also required mapping to inflation data manually uploaded by the stakeholder and FIPS code mapping for state names, which we were able to do using Tableau's multi-connection data source capability. Some ETL transformations were done using all tricks to combine country and state level data, as well as breaking up series and industry codes for mapping specific measures and locations. Now, Aaron is gonna speak on the data prep and ingestion process for the Bureau of Labor Statistics and U.S. Census Bureau data. The BLS and Census data are two different data sets that require separate ingestion, pro ingestion processes, but both are very similar. Our end goal for the ingestion is to get public data from an API call and then deliver it to a table in our Hive data warehouse stored in our Hadoop ecosystem so it can be easily accessed by Alteryx to then make its way to the Tableau dashboard. Here is an overview of the BLS and Census ingestion in the open table solution. We really only had the last stream set step. However, during development, some functionality limitations to stream sets were exposed that allow us to utilize other technologies to enhance stream sets even further. The first tool we use in the process is ControlM, which is a user-friendly scheduler that schedules a, um, a special Python code for stream sets it's called StreamSets SDK. The code uses a library to connect to the stream sets environment and interact with it programmatically. We use it to start and stop stream sets pipeline jobs. Within the job itself in StreamSets, it connects to a public API URL and processes the data to the highest table destination. This is an overview of the order that the process goes in every day. I'll dive deeper into each step, but I'll go in reverse order as it was the order taken during development. This way, it's easier to understand and showcase the discovery of technology limitations and the solutions taken to fix them. First, I'll take you to the start. I'll take you through the raw BLS and census data sets you're looking at. They both come in two different flavors of JSON files, a multi-dimensional array and a JSON object. So you can see there's slightly different syntax in there. For the US census data, the requirement was to collect monthly retail sales data from 1992 to the current year. However, when submitting the API URL, we can only submit one year of the parameter at a time. So in order to get all the data, we'll need 30 different API calls. For the BLS data, instead of year we want, data for about 1,000 different data series IDs. Luckily for this API call, we can include a list of up to 50 series IDs at a time as a parameter, so we don't have to do 1,000 different calls. Instead, we would need about 20 different API calls in order to get all the data. Here we have the stream sets pipeline used for census. The BLS pipeline looks slightly different because it processes its JSON file type a little differently, but the overall structure is the same. The pipeline starts with an HTTP client module. This screenshot is currently selected, so you can see a little bit of the configuration where the public API URL is specified. From there, a JSON evaluator, field renamer, and field splitter are all configured to manipulate the JSON file into the desired format. Um, then based on criteria gets split into two different tables that both then truncate and reload the highest table with the Hive metadata and Metastore modules. While the pipeline has great functionality, the HTTP client origin only allows one API call at a time. And if you remember from earlier, BLS and Census require 20 to 30 each. Fortunately, a limitation to stream sets is that it lacks the ability to loop through a list of different API calls. In order to increase functionality, we can utilize StreamSets SDK Python code. According to the StreamSets website, StreamSets SDK allows developers to automate the creation and execution of data flow pipelines from StreamSets execution engines and StreamSets environments. SDK allows us to use a more programmatic approach to expand the platform's capabilities. In the StreamSets environment, we publish the pipeline we created as a job template. A job template allows us to spawn different job instances off of it with um, and with specified parameters to use in the job. So in our case, we can parameterize the year for census and a list of series ID for BLS in order to have a different API call each time. On the slide is a pseudocode that takes you through a high-level overview of the programmatic approach for the census data specifically. 
First, the StreamSet SDK library is imported, so we're able to connect to StreamSet to retrieve the job template with a job template ID. Start year is initialized in the current year. Um, it's also initialized based on today's days. So that'd be 2022. And we loop through each year from 1992 to 2022. And we use the year as a parameter, and the job is spawned off from the job template. And um, with that year, we use it in the API URL call. The code is programmatically um, waiting for the job to be in completion status, and then it gets deleted to prevent clutter from all these spawn jobs being created, especially if we increase the number of years or increase the number of series IDs, there'll be even more jobs created. Then the next year would get started, and it would loop through the same thing again. And of course, the code for BLS is very similar once again. It's just slightly different because it loops through a list of series IDs. To schedule the stream sets SDK Python code to run every day, we used a control M scheduler. According to their website, control M is used to monitor batch schedules from different application groups and multiple servers to reduce the resource manual work. Ultimately, we use control M as a centralized interface to monitor and manage batch processes within our organization. The perk of it is, is that it's very user friendly. Jobs are scheduled for modules that we can drag and drop into organized folders and order the jobs into a desired schedule. For this use case, we configure the module's general properties with the command we want to use to run the code, what user should run it, etc. Um, there's a screenshot of the module's scheduling properties, which is configured to run the command every day between 5.15 and 6.15 a.m. Other properties we can configure include a customizable email notification upon the completion or failure of a job. Um, overall, though, StreamSet is super interactive that we can visually assess what jobs have been completed, as indicated by a green check mark, what is yet to run, like a gray hourglass to indicate waiting for scheduled time. The module will also appear red if it fails in yellow while a job is running. So to bring it back all together in the correct order of events, we have a control and scheduler that submits the command to start the stream set to SDK Python code. Within the stream test SDK code, we move through a list of years or series IDs to use as parameters to spawn after jobs from a jobs template. So we'll base the job to complete and then it will delete it. Within the stream test pipeline job itself, the job um, parameter is used to call a specific API URL. The data is then ingested to our hive table, our target. In the end, we were able to engage multiple technologies to enhance each other in the data ingestion and allow easier data access for subsequent data processing and alter eventually Tableau. So for a quick project recap, as you can see here in our project diagram, we had other data sources and dashboards we were able to drive insights from for this project. Some examples include data on small business revenues, eviction filings, and consumer spending data. All these data sources were allowed the Office of Budget and Management and our client stakeholder to make insights and drive policy decisions around how state citizens and businesses were performing in the face of the COVID pandemic. Go over some quick insights gained on this project. Tableau's mapping functionality allowed us to visualize at the census tract level up to whole countries. Tableau's parameters and sheet swapping capabilities allowed for cleaner, more efficient visualizations of the data. Tableau's ability to connect to multiple analytics tools and platforms cut down on data cleansing and development time. Weekly economic reporting for our client was cut down from a multi-day development process to approximately a single hour per week. Now we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Hey, thank you so much, Aaron and Will. That was a great presentation. Um, Please feel free to drop any questions you might have into the chat or use the Q&A function. Um, we did have one question come in. So um, I know that this uh, session was covering a government project, but how could this be used in higher education? So thankfully, uh, there's a lot of higher education publicly available data sets and um, Aaron and I, um, Typically, I've seen before, I think uh, on data.gov, you can access um, lots of data sets around student loans or just graduation rates and different uh, metrics when it comes to higher ed. So you can look at your internal data um, as compared to national uh, level data or specific colleges. Yeah, from a data engineering standpoint, um, 
all that data should have a public API uh, URL that you can connect to just like this um, and utilize a, a similar data engineering um, ingestion process. Um, and it doesn't always have to be stream sets to use either. The nice thing though about stream sets is that it's code free. So um, there's a lot of possibility there, especially if you're as experienced with code, but um, it also, you know, allows you to connect to different types of sources. It doesn't have to be public API um, like that. It can be um, internal things as well. And if you don't use stream sets, there's, you know, you can Python code, you can use Spark, you can use Scoop. There's a lot of different um, data engineering ingestion options out there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then what were some of the bottlenecks or pain points uh, that you faced when building these views? Um, so some of the one main kind of pain point is that you can run into um, when you're working with publicly available data sets is you can have a lack of control over the source data. So um, not having control over, you know, if the when the data is refreshed or when it's run or um, if specific formats are changing, which happened in our open table situation. Um, you have to be able to be adaptable and create, you know, adaptable, adaptable ingestion processes and tools um, in order to be flexible with um, the possibility that that might happen. Awesome. Um, and then one other question. So what would you say was the biggest benefit that your client saw um, when using these views and this automated process? So I think the biggest benefit we saw was this was a process that was taking um, our client a lot of work and manual labor on a weekly basis, which showed them away from being able to spend time in, around strategy and in meetings um, to make decisions on the data. They were spending more time actually prepping and getting the data ready to present on a weekly basis. So this completely eliminated um, most of that work out of the way so that they could focus on, you know, how can they make decisions off these insights and also um, help their constituents in the, in the state. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron Will. Um, if you have any other questions or want to learn more, um, please reach out to Aaron or Will, or you can reach out to um, info at avap.com. Like I said at the beginning, this session was recorded, so you can expect to see it in your inbox in about two business days. Um, would love if you shared with your colleagues or watched again. Um, and also, like I said, a survey will pop up um, on your screen once we end this. So would love if everyone could just take one minute to um, answer those questions. Um, so thank you so much for your time today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Aaron and Will. Yep, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.